What's up, everybody? I want to say a very special welcome to each and every one of you. I also say, want to say a special welcome to those of you joining us at a microsite, multi-site, M group on the internet. However it is that you're joining us, let's make everybody feel welcome. Come on now. So we're in the middle of summer at Mana, and this is the uh, Philemon series. And in our last series, The Advocate, we picked on the lawyers a lot, a whole heap. Some of the jokes were funny. Some of the jokes were not. You know, they just kind of were there. But this time, uh, we, got some, we got some preacher jokes. And I'm real excited to deliver this one to you to, to, right now. Can, can you, are you ready for that? Can I give you a preacher joke? All right, cool, because I'm kind of just making fun of myself-ish, but I'm not really a preacher, but we're just going to go with it, okay? This is, so if this is going to work, then you're going to have to laugh uh, when I'm sarcastic, okay? So I'm going to say something sarcastic, and you? I love it. I love it. We're going to be good together. So these two guys die, and they go to heaven, and they're standing in front of St. Peter, who somehow always gets stuck on, like, do I let people in or not detail? So Peter's standing there, and he's going through the role, and this guy steps up, and He's in, he's in jeans, and they're somewhat slim, and he's got a black T-shirt on and a denim jacket. <laughs> well, I didn't tell you his name yet. So, so he says, my name's Jack Thomas Jr., and I'm a taxi driver in New York City. So Peter goes, pause one second, flips to the roll. Yep, I see you. Welcome into your eternal kingdom destiny. Sir, here is a golden staff and a silken robe. So the guy behind him was like, all right, so if this, is, if this is what happens with taxi drivers, then I know I'm going to be good. So he stands up, and in his best preacher voice, he says, my name is Joseph James. I was the pastor of St. Mary's Church for 43 years. And Peter goes, one sec, flips to the roll. Oh, yep, sure, there you are. So here's a cotton robe and a uh, wooden stick. So the dude's like, yeah, okay, so no, pause. You didn't hear what I said. I said, pastor, 43 years, like, what, what just, so Peter said, well, sorry, sir, up here we work on results. So while you preached, people slept. While Jack drove, people prayed. Mm, mm, that's good. All right. Speaking of nothing to do with that, uh, we're in the midst of a series on Philemon. And last week we looked at Paul, this week we're going to look at Philemon, and the next week we're going to talk about the protagonist, Onesimus. So today we're going to focus on Philemon, and we're just going to walk through this one or two verses at a time. Now, there's only one chapter in Philemon, so Philemon 1, there's not 25 chapters, I'm going to go through 25 verses. So let's jump in right here, Philemon, verse 1, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our dear friend and fellow worker, to Apphia, our sister, to Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church that meets in your home. Notice that Paul starts off by identifying himself as a prisoner, which is interesting because Paul, when he identifies himself all throughout the New Testament, identifies himself as an apostle. And he's right in saying that. He's not overstating the fact that this guy is a living legend. He is known all throughout Christendom, all throughout the world. Everybody knows who Paul is. And it's very interesting. The tone of this book immediately takes a different turn right off the bat because he starts by saying, I'm Paul, a prisoner, a needy man suffering for his faith. This letter is completely different. Now, he has a very personal request to make of Philemon. Philemon is a wealthy businessman in the city of Colossae. And the others mentioned here, Apphia is his wife and Archippus is is his son who serves in full-time ministry in the church in Colossae. To orient you with uh, this church, there's a letter written to this church called Colossians. So this is that same, this is that same group. Verse 3, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers because I hear about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints. Now, Paul has probably heard about Philemon through Philemon's runaway slave, Onesimus, who we're going to talk more about as this chapter, as this, as this book goes on, and even more again next week. As you'll see in a few moments, Philemon has come to know Jesus as his Savior through Paul's ministry. And no doubt, this has had a big impact on Onesimus's life. No doubt, Paul has also heard about Philemon's faith through the people who have traveled from Colossae to Rome. Verse 6, I pray that you may be active in sharing your faith so that you will have a full understanding of every good thing in Christ. Paul is praying that the power of the gospel go out through Philemon 
At the same time, the power of the gospel might work in Philemon. So what, what Paul is actually praying for Philemon is that he begins to mature spiritually. What's getting ready, what we're getting ready to unpack is Philemon's going to have to take the gospel that he knows and the gospel that he knows, and he's going to have to act out of the gospel that he knows and the gospel that he holds. Because as he acts and takes that step, the gospel activates itself, and now his doing is informing his knowing, which is informing his doing, which is a picture of spiritual maturity. So Paul is saying, I want you to be active and share your faith so that you have a full understanding, because your activity informs your understanding. Verse 7, your love has given me great joy and encouragement because you, brother, have refreshed the hearts of the saints. Now, Philemon is a godly man. Philemon's house is the place where the church from Colossae meets. He opens his home to itinerant pastors. He houses the church. He's been faithful in every way, and he's played a very big part in the development of the church in Colossae. Verse 8, therefore, although in Christ I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do, so Paul knows that Philemon would obey him if he said, this is what you're going to do, now do this. So, you know, the very first step of obedience is just to obey. But Paul's not talking about an outward conformity. Paul is talking about something deeper, and he's talking about obedience that's birthed out of an inward reality, right? How many of you have ever, have ever known outward obedience not always to bring along with it inner conformity? Anybody got kids in the room? I know I do. So sometimes the outward conformity may be there, but I don't have the heart. That's right. In verse 9, he begins to reach for this that he's talking about. He begins to reach for the heart. Yet I appeal to you on the basis of love. I then as Paul, an old man, and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus. Now Paul is 63 years of age at this point. And his, the, this 63 years of life, he's been on four missionary journeys. He has walked thousands of miles. He has taken, taken countless beatings. This 63 years of age is beginning to wear on Paul. And Paul is beginning to experience the breaking down of his body as he continues to walk. I guess it's a pun on accident. Didn't even mean to do that. As he continues to walk out the call of God on his life. But he makes this argument not on the basis of obedience, but on the basis of love. Philemon's love for God, but also Paul's love for Onesimus. Again, this sounds strange coming from Paul. If you remember our talk last week about the Apostle Paul, this is the same guy who in Lystra is preaching, and they stone him. Now, this would not be the first time. This, this was a common practice in this time. This would not be the first time this group of people had stoned anyone. So Paul is stoned, some historians believe, to the point of death and appearing dead. Some historians actually believe he was stoned to death, and the Holy Spirit raised him again. I kind of tend to fall into that camp because this is not the first time this group has stoned somebody. So it's not like they're just heaving stones and going, well, he kind of looks dead. I mean, they probably checked on him or something, right? He stands back up and walks back into the city and continues to preach. This is a dude who, he's pretty rough. He's pretty rough and tumble. If you're familiar with the Peter Paul circumcision debate, uh, read what he says about that whole thing. He doesn't often mince words. But notice the term that Paul uses for Onesimus in verse 10. He's appealing on the basis of love, not obedience, which is interesting for Paul. But then he goes on in verse 10 to say something very interesting for Paul. I appeal to you for my son, Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. Now, Paul has not gotten married. He's not gone to Rome and gotten married and had a kid. And even if he did, you do the math enough to know that if he had a kid in these couple of years, he's not going to send him back on a journey to Colossae on his own. So this is not his physical son. This is a son in the faith, but he only ever uses that nomenclature, that term, one other time. And it's for his number one disciple, Timothy. In many ways, Paul views his continued legacy through the church to be carried on by this guy, Timothy. Timothy was born to a Greek father who has passed away, and he was raised by his mother and his grandmother. And Paul has taken him on journeys now with him, and he loves he loves this kid so much. As a matter of fact, in Philippi, stuff starts to get crazy, and Paul who has a time or two before pulled out the Roman citizen card, which gets him out of beating. So he's played this card before, but interestingly enough, in Philippi, he doesn't do that. Now, why would he not pull out the Roman citizen card and say, whoa, hold up, you can't beat me without a trial? Why would he take the beating without saying anything? He had Timothy on his second journey with him. He and Timothy are together. 
Timothy is a Greek, a Jewish Greek, who is not a Roman citizen. So if Paul plays the Roman citizen card, that crowd's going to beat somebody. And Paul wasn't going to let that beating go to Timothy. His love for Timothy is really deep. So for him to call a runaway slave Onesimus, his son, this is significant. Onesimus is special to Paul, and this is why he's being so tender in this letter. His heart's wide open. Now, we know that Philemon has every right, and some would say an obligation under Roman law, to put Onesimus to death. He's a runaway slave who we're going to find out in just a minute has probably stolen something from Philemon. And unless there was going to be an an uprising, the way the Romans kind of held control over people was through acts of cruelty. And so some would argue that Philemon has an obligation to punish Onesimus. Now, Onesimus has become a believer while under Paul's ministry uh, while he's on house arrest in Rome, which raises some questions. How did that happen? And how did Onesimus make it to Rome? And did he run into Paul, or did he go looking for him? I mean, Rome's not, Rome's not Hope Mills. Hope Mills. Hey, that's, not, that's not a slide on Hope Mills. I'm just saying it in Rome. It's a big city, right? Did he look for Paul? Did he run into him? He knows that Philemon knows Paul, and that could mean trouble for Onesimus. So why is he interacting with Paul? We'll answer those questions next week. But for now, we understand that not only has Onesimus become a believer, but he's grown in his faith, and he's become a co-worker of Paul, an important co-worker. Paul says, I I need him. I need this guy. He's become like his very own son, and Paul loves him like a son. Remember in verse 9, I appeal to you on the basis of love, his love for his son in the faith, Onesimus. Formerly, he was useless to you. I'm in verse 11. Formerly, he was useless to you, but now he's become useful both to you and to me. Paul is making a play on words here because the name Onesimus literally means useful. Useful or profitable. Paul is in effect telling Philemon, the guy did you wrong before he even ran away and he wasn't even super useful, but now he knows Jesus and he's helped me and he's been useful to me in many ways. Now he's become necessary to me in my old age through this very tough time. I need him and I love him like a son. Now, I could see how Onesimus would be useful to Paul. I could see how companionship in this time in Paul's life, I could see how Onesimus could become useful to Paul. But how could Onesimus become useful to Philemon again? As we'll see in a few minutes, the likelihood is that Onesimus has offended Philemon in more than just running away as his slave. See, the distance between Colossae and Rome is five days' journey if the weather's good, if it's not like it currently is here in the Fayetteville Fort Bragg region and dumping down rain every four minutes. It's a five-day journey if the weather's good, and those five days on foot also include, it's a thousand miles, five-day journey, a thousand miles, it also includes two sea voyages. So he's a runaway slave, which means he probably hightailed it some way, got out somehow, and he's not, he's, he's not got a lot of money, if any money. So it's likely that he stole from Philemon, because otherwise he has to, on the road, give the appearance that, oh, look, there's a runaway slave. He has to give off the appearance that he's not destitute. He has to travel a thousand miles. He has to book at least two uh, one-way sea passages, and that's whether he slept and ate and all manner of what he did at night. So no doubt, though, the money that he's stolen is long gone, and there's no way that he's going to be able to pay it back. So what I'm trying to paint for you here is a bit of the picture of what Paul's heading to and your understanding of some of the roadblocks that face what Paul's getting ready to ask Philemon to do. There's some significant human elements in here that are going to make this continuation of this book just a little bit tricky. Paul goes on in verse 12, I'm sending him who is my very heart back to you. Paul is saying losing him would be like pulling out my heart, but I'm sending him back to you. Why? Why would you send him back. Verse 13, I would have liked to keep him with me so that he could take your place in helping me while I'm in chains for the gospel. But I did not want to do anything without your consent so that any favor you do will be spontaneous and not forced. There are two sides to the story, remember? There's Philemon's side, which we're discussing today, but there's also Onesimus's story. He's come to Christ under the ministry of Paul, and he's found real freedom. He's found freedom from sin, but now he's being asked to go home 
and present himself to his former master, a man from whom he has stolen, a master from whom he has run away, and I wager Onesimus probably knows what happens to runaway slaves who get caught. I bet he knows the potential of what faces him if this doesn't go the way it's supposed to go. God is at work in two hearts here, and both are going to have to reach pretty deep. Onesimus is facing potential death if Philemon turns him over to the Romans and decides not to forgive him. So you ask, why go back at all? Onesimus, why would you go back at all? I'm going to answer that question next week. But Philemon, a man described as loving, faithful, generous, etc., is having to have a gut check here. It's obvious where Paul is heading. It's obvious that Paul's getting ready to ask Philemon to forgive Onesimus, and not only to forgive Onesimus, but to forgive the debt that Onesimus should pay back but can't. Now, Philemon stands to lose on two levels here. He's going to lose any investment he's made in Onesimus as his slave. He's going to lose that completely. And if he forgives Onesimus and restores him, he's also going to lose whatever it is that Onesimus stole from him. And so Paul, in in somewhat more typical Paul fashion, goes a little deeper. Verse 15, perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back for good, no longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. He's very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a man and as a brother in the Lord. Paul proposes maybe God allowed this to happen so the young man could find the gospel. Basically, Paul's asking Philemon, what's Onesimus' soul worth? What's his eternity worth? Onesimus left Philemon as a slave, but he returns as a brother. He was a slave, then an enemy, then he met Christ, and now he's the son of God. Therefore, you're Philemon, your brother, and I want you to treat him like that. What if your long-lost brother was coming home? Now, I love the second part of verse 16. Remember how Paul described Onesimus to Philemon in verses 9 through 13? Paul called him a son, and he said Onesimus was very dear to him. Now look at the second part of verse 16. He's a very dear, he is very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a man and as a brother in the Lord. Paul says, look, I love him like a son, but I didn't have to forgive him. You have to forgive him, and when you do forgive him, you reach, when you reach deep and let all that pain and all that loss go, he'll become more dear to you because of the work of God in your heart to bring you to this place. Paul's driven a little bit deeper now because now he's talking about Philemon and the posture of Philemon's heart. This is going to be better for you, Philemon, in the long run when you not only conform outwardly and do what it is I'm getting ready to ask you to do, but if your heart is the thing that informs your obedience. And Onesimus, he knows you have the power to put him to death. He knows that. But when you forgive him such a great debt, he'll love you forever. Verse 17, so if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. In verse 1, Paul called Philemon a dear friend and a fellow worker. I cannot overstate the legend of Paul at this moment in history. For him to say to Philemon, fellow worker, elevates Philemon way beyond the station that Philemon probably looked at himself as holding, meaning Philemon would have been blown away by the fact that Paul called him, hey, fellow worker. In this verse, he revisits that idea, 17, beginning of it. So if you consider me a partner, Philemon is kind, he's generous, he serves people, but here Paul is calling him a partner. And in doing so, he pulls Philemon up to his level and gives Philemon a glimpse of how God sees him, the pronoun him there meaning Philemon. He gives Philemon a glimpse of how God sees Philemon on the same plane as Paul, a cherished child of of God and a valuable player in the kingdom. I wonder what kind of impact this had on Philemon's heart. The church-planting, Bible-writing, miracle-working Paul calls me a partner? Partners are equal. Partners are equal. In a partnership, there's not one that's greater than the other. Partners are equal. I wonder if there's a lesson for us here as well. I'm not sure that we always see ourselves the way that God sees us. I'm not sure that our perspective is always the same 
as the way that God sees us. Paul isn't playing here. He's, he's simply looking at Onesimus the way that God looks at Onesimus. And in doing so, he's showing Philemon, this is how you should look at Onesimus. And then he tells Philemon, when Onesimus comes, welcome him as you would welcome me. Well, how do you think Philemon would have welcomed Paul into his home? Respect, honor, probably a party, probably killing something very fatted and meaty. Do that, invite me over, we're going to have a party. I like meat. Treat him like he is my son, Paul is saying. No, better than that, treat him like he's God's son. Verse 18, Paul goes on, if he's done anything to wrong you or owes anything, charge it to me. Paul offers to pay the debt of the stolen money. But again, we're going to see a play on words here in the Greek. Charge it to me is better translated count it to me and is used only in one other passage in the New Testament. But the best translation, the most accurate translation of this phrase would be impute it to me. And we see this in Romans 5, 12 through 21, where Paul's talking about how Adam's sin was imputed to us, condemning us forever. Then our sin was imputed to Christ, saving us forever. And then his righteousness was imputed to us, justifying us, giving us life forever. In a sense, Paul is telling Philemon, just like your sin was imputed to Christ, so let Onesimus' financial debt be imputed to me. This is a pretty big word picture here. I will pay, Paul says. Verse 19, I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. No, 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 this is me. I'm, this is me, Paul. I'm writing this with my own hand. I will pay it back. Paul's sincere in paying Onesimus' debt. But the highest action would be for Philemon to forgive it just like he's been forgiven. Back half of 19, not to mention that you owe me your very self. So Paul has led Philemon to, to Christ, obviously, or he's making that claim here at least. But what's funny about that is Paul never went to Colossae. As a matter of fact, Paul didn't plant the church in Colossae. We're going to find out in the book of Galatians in the fourth chapter that Epaphras planted the church in Colossae. So how is it that Paul led Philemon to faith in Jesus? Well, we don't have hard evidence from Scripture, but if we piece together some other portions of the story, we might get just an idea of the potential of how this might have happened. So, Philemon is a wealthy businessman in the city of Colossae. Now, in Ephesus, which is 100 miles away, Paul has planted a very vibrant church. Now, Ephesus at the time is like a New York City kind of hub of commercial trade and of culture and of, it's just a melting pot of all of these different things, and Paul has planted a very vibrant church. Now, if Philemon is a wealthy businessman in Colossae, he will have traveled back and forth between Ephesus, making a number of contacts, a number of business trips. It is likely that Philemon came to faith in Jesus through Paul's ministry in Ephesus. This might also be why Onesimus, when he flees Philemon, doesn't run to Ephesus. Think about it. You've got 100 miles to a big old massive honking city where I can hide, or I've got 1,000 miles to Rome. Why would I go 1,000 miles to Rome? Because he knows that Philemon is constantly in the city and has a number of contacts. It's possible that the reason that Onesimus, possible, I didn't say guaranteed, don't go put this on the test, but it's possible that Onesimus fled to Rome to avoid the network of contacts that Philemon had made in all of Philemon's business dealings. He feared he might run into Philemon there. So Paul is reminding Philemon, I'm asking you to have compassion on a man that I led to the Lord, just like I led you to the Lord. Let's pick it up in verse 20. I do wish, brother, that I may have some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I ask. Paul is confident that Philemon is going to receive Onesimus not as a slave, but as a brother. Further, he's confident that Philemon is going to forgive forgive. Excuse me, I can hardly speak. Further, he's pretty confident that Philemon is going to forgive the debt of the money that Onesimus stole from him, even though Paul is willing to pay. But we don't have that answer in this letter. The question then remains, what became of Onesimus? Did Philemon forgive him? This is the last time I'm going to tell you that that's coming next week. <laughs> but let me just say to you, 
in the study for the preparation of this message, what you find out about Onesimus, it's like the hook to the best song you've heard. It's like the punchline to a good joke. It's like, it, it, it is mind-blowing. You cannot miss what happens to Onesimus as a result of this letter. It's just, I guarantee you're going to be shocked. Continuing on in verse 22, and one thing more, prepare a guest room for me because I hope to be restored to you in answer to your prayers. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends you greetings, and so do Mark, Aristarchus, or some guy like that kind of name right there, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you in spirit. So who are all these people, and why are they listed at the end of the letter. Remember that Philemon is from Colossae, so Onesimus is traveling from Rome with Paul back to Colossae. And the interesting thing here we're going to find out in Colossians, Onesimus is carrying two letters from Paul in this, at this period of time. He's carrying the letter to Philemon, and he's also carrying a letter to the church in Colossae entitled, well, it wasn't entitled, it wasn't like Paul titled, and that's what we've got. We call it Colossians. So let's, to understand more about who these people are, let's take a look at the final greeting in the letter to the Colossians. This is in Colossians chapter 4, verse 7 through 18. Tychicus, a traveling companion of Paul, will tell you all the news about me. He is a dear brother, a faithful minister, and a fellow servant in the Lord. I'm sending him to you for the express purpose that you may know about our circumstances and that me, he may encourage your hearts. Fun part. Verse 9, he's coming with Onesimus our faithful and dear brother. Notice no mention of his former slave status. He's carrying, imagine if you will, he's carrying both these letters, one under one arm, one under the other. One says to Philemon, forgive this dude and restore him. The other already has him in that status. Kind of cool. He's coming with Onesimus, our faithful and dear brother. Notice no mention of his former slave status, who's one of you from Colossae. They will tell you everything that is happening here, and Onesimus has just been elevated to co-worker and co-laborer with Paul because now he's got information that he's going to communicate from Paul to the church in Colossae. My fellow prisoner, Aristarchus, another faithful companion of Paul, he was with Paul in the riots in Ephesus, sends you his greetings, as does Mark, the cousin of Barnabas. You have received instructions about him. If he comes to you, welcome him. Jesus, who's called Justus, also sends greetings. These are the only Jews among my fellow workers for the kingdom of God, and they have provided a comfort to me. Epaphras, this is the dude who in all likelihood planted the church in uh, Colossae. Epaphras, who is one of you and a servant of Christ Jesus, sends greetings. He is always wrestling in prayer for you that you may stand firm in all the will of God, mature and fully assured. I vouch for him that he's working hard for you and for those in Laodicea and Heropolis. It's likely that Epaphras planted those two churches as well. Our dear friend Luke, the doctor, and Demas send greetings. Give my greetings to the brothers at Laodicea and to Nympha and the church in her house. After this letter has been read, see that it is also read to the church of the Laodiceans and that you in turn read the letter from Laodicea. These are called circular letters. Paul wrote them with the intent that they be read at their destination, but in the stops, the churches along the way, and even continuing on from there. The purpose, so Ephesus was a circular letter as well. It was written to the church in Ephesus, but it was meant to inform all the churches along the way and then be read and passed around from there. Tell Archippus, this is Philemon's son, tell Archippus, see to it that you complete the work that you've received in the Lord. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. Remember my chains. Grace be with you. So before we close, let me give you three brief takeaways from this talk on Philemon, the book of Philemon, focusing on the character of Philemon. The first, the value of a thing is determined by what someone would pay for it, and God established your worth by trading Jesus for you. Let's learn to look at people through those lenses and not through the lenses of socioeconomic status, age, race, looks, intellect. Treat every believer like a brother and a sister and every unbeliever like a potential believer. The price that was paid for you gets to dictate your worth. Which leads very nicely to number two, be the best you that you can be because everybody else is already taken. God sees every 
believer as a vital equal partner in his kingdom plan to planet earth. We have a saying around here, we say it a lot, we believe that God created you on purpose for a purpose and placed you in history for such a time as this. That's not just preacher talk designed to amp you up. I'm telling you, God created you on purpose for a purpose and every single believer is a part of God's plan to impact the planet for his kingdom. Now you might say, I'm not, I'm not Billy Graham, I'm not Paul, I'm not even Philemon. No, that's really beside the point because they're called to run their race, you're just called to run yours. I'm called to be the best me that I can possibly be. I'm not meant to be my father. I'm not meant to be my grandfather. I'm not meant to be my brother. I'm not meant to be you. I'm meant to be me. And when I become the best me that I possibly can in keeping with the price that God paid for me, the death of his only son, baby, we can change the world. Stop measuring yourself by other people's calling and other people's place in the kingdom. Stop comparing. And lastly, number three, we owe everyone. We owe everyone, say it with me, we owe everyone honor and respect, no matter, no matter their station in life. Look at how Paul treated the runaway slave and the wealthy businessman. He treated them the same. Both were partners to Paul. Both were sons of God. Both were worthy of honor and respect. If you want people to honor and respect you, pay your dues. Honor and respect everyone. Look at people the way that God looks at people. Worth the price of his only begotten son. Bow your heads. Let me pray for you. Jesus, we thank you. Man, we were worse than runaway slaves. We were your enemy. Far from you, incapable of saving ourselves, and yet you came and led a sinless life and died on the cross that we might once again become useful in your kingdom, and we're so grateful for that. Father, I pray that each and every person within the sound of my voice right now begins the process of looking at others and even looking at themselves through the lens that you have for us. Thank you, God, for your grace. Thank you for your son. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. If you keep your head bowed for one more moment, for one more prayer. The book of Romans, written by this man, Paul, says that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Each and every one of us has a problem, and that problem is sin. There's a gap between us and God, and it's caused by our sin. And the way that you make that right is by accepting the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. Jesus came and he led a sinless life and he died in your place to take your punishment. And it's impossible to imagine that we would gather here or that we would gather anywhere that you're watching right now, or even if you're just watching this online on your phone, it's impossible for me to imagine holding a microphone in my hand and not saying to you, Jesus died that you might have life eternally with him. So if that's you and you find yourself in that predicament, never having asked Jesus to be the replacement for your sins, and I want to give you that opportunity. So here in this room right now, at every one of our sites that are watching right now, and even online, if that's you, I just want to ask you to slip your hand and hold it up right there. Hold it up long enough for me to see it. I promise I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to have you come down. I'm not going to have you come forward. I just want to lead us all in a prayer. We're all going to pray together in a moment, and I want to know who I'm praying with. So if that's you, just slip your hand up. Hold it there long enough for me to see it.